Mr. Burns is the true villain of the Simpson family history. We saw it in the Mona timeline, we saw it in the Grandpa timeline. No matter where the Simpsons go throughout history, the Burns family is there to torment them. Well, maybe not in the future. At least not the near future. As for today, we're going to try to figure out how Mr. Burns got to this point. Find out what created this miserly monster. Was it his parents? His lost teddy bear? Those darn hippies? Or is the real villain of the piece Simpsons continuity? The history of Mr. Burns can be broken into four distinct eras. First, boyhood. Second, the wealthy gadabout. Third, World War II. And fourth, building an empire. Similar to the Grandpa timeline study, we're going to go through each era one at a time, listing what happened chronologically, and then trying to work out the inconsistencies. Mr. Burns is not typically portrayed as senile as Grandpa, but this is the Simpsons writers we're dealing with. The floating timeline is going to wreak havoc throughout Burns' historical events, and the writers will retcon stuff as needed. I tried to be as thorough as possible in finding Burns' flashbacks to earlier in his life. Big thanks to the Simpsons wikis for providing such a good starting point in researching these moments, by the way. But given the hundreds and hundreds of Burns' appearances, there's going to be a lot of old-timey stories and references that will fall through the cracks. So let me know anything major that I might have missed. Now, on with the show. Mr. Burns was born over a thousand years ago on the massive supercontinent known as Pangea. At least, that's what a couple episodes say. As we all know, Mr. Burns' age has always been a running joke on the show. Four-digit ages and whatnot. According to Homer and Delilah, Mr. Burns is only 81. However, later seasons put him at over 100 years old, most commonly cited as 104. The floating timeline would put his birth date in the late 19th century to the early 20th. Burns himself has stated that he was born in 1881. I'm going to use this date as a starting point for reference, and we'll see if it jives with everything in the end. So anyway, Charles Montgomery Plantagenet Schlickelgruber Burns was born in the late 19th century, the youngest of 11 children or the second youngest of 12 children. He was first tended to by a nanny, or at least until Burns fired her. Growing up, he had a beloved teddy bear named Bobo, which was always by his side, until one fateful day when his parents gave him a choice to continue living with them or with a twisted, loveless billionaire. Mr. Burns, of course, immediately chose the billionaire. We don't have the specifics, but this appears to be some kind of financial arrangement by Burns' parents. They don't seem particularly rich right here. Burns essentially is given the choice between familial love and massive wealth. However, there is evidence that this mysterious billionaire is actually Mr. Burns' grandfather. We learned about Burns' rich ancestors from the Civil War era. And more specifically, Burns fondly remembers the days of going to the atom mill with his grandfather. Just look at this guy. This flashback from Rosebud is especially confusing because there is a great deal of evidence that not only were his biological parents wealthy, but that he lived with them for the majority of his childhood. We'll set aside this inconsistency for now. Master Burns would spend his carefree days on the Springfield waterfront, crippling Irishmen like most children do. Or else he and his father would enjoy a Yale football game together. However, it was not always sunny for young Master Burns. In 1912, he was a passenger on the Titanic, only surviving by making a raft out of steerage passengers. One year later, he participated in the Pee Wee pageant of 1913, performing a dance routine for the crowd. Unfortunately, his pants fell down during his performance, and then his underwear, mooning the entire crowd. His mother called him a laughingstock, and Monty felt humiliated. He then took an interest in comic books. However, his father callously confiscated them, declaring he should be playing outside instead. To teach Monty a lesson, his father bought the comic book publisher and burned it down. In 1935, Monty and his parents visited Gimbel's department store, and he sat on Santa's lap. For Christmas, all he wanted was a hug from his mom and a smile from his dad. 
He excitedly counted down the days until Christmas. But alas, when the day came, he got neither a hug nor a smile, and was instead shipped off to boarding school. Monty never saw his parents again, as they died shortly afterward. He ended up inheriting the entire family fortune, as all of his older siblings had died unexpectedly. Not sure exactly when, guessing it was at a young age, since we never see them around. One sibling was trampled by a horse, one ate a poisoned potato, his twin was shot, and the rest were stabbed, another poisoned potato, spontaneous combustion, fell down a well, potato, potato, and impaled on the Chrysler building. It is currently unknown whether young Monty Burns murdered his siblings for the inheritance money. There is no evidence of this, but given how Burns immediately pivots to warning Bart about conniving relatives and describing the accidents that could happen, well, it makes me wonder. Before Burns sues me for slander, we'll call this the end of part one. As you can tell, Mr. Burns' early years are a giant mess in terms of its consistency. You've got season 5's Rosebud, implying that Burns permanently left his parents and Bobo behind. Then you've got season 31's Bobby It's Cold Outside, saying they actually sent him to boarding school and died. This detail is especially odd, considering we met his mother in season 7, who was very much alive. It seems pretty clear to me that the writers retconned some of this early season stuff, in an effort to examine Burns' relationship with his parents. If we wanted to make everything work in-universe, there's clearly a piece of the puzzle we don't know about. Perhaps the grandfather didn't approve of his son's marriage, disowned him, and later arranged to adopt Monty as his heir. Or maybe this guy, whoever he was, died shortly afterward, and his parents took over as guardians again. The only thing we do know is that Monty Burns never had a loving, supportive relationship with his parents. Monty rejected them, they were aloof and uncaring. Sounds like a recipe for some dynamite college years, huh? Mr. Burns attended Yale University, graduating as part of the class of 1914. He was the big man on campus, playing for the football team, as well as wrestling in the etherweight class, earning the nickname the New Haven Nuisance. In addition, he squared off against Teddy Roosevelt in the boxing ring. He was generally popular with the ladies, although that Mimsy Bancroft never reciprocated his advances. Burns had a roommate named Dink, and was a member of Skull and Bones. Unfortunately, his college popularity was fleeting. When Burns lost his strawberry golden curls during his senior year, he was forced to hunker down and take a more serious interest in science. After graduating, Burns must have discovered the wonderful world of toupees, because hey, now his hair is back. While living in France, he proposed to a woman named Lila, who was presumably his cousin. Unfortunately, Monty wouldn't agree to think of others for five minutes a day, so she left him. As a result, Mr. Burns did what many ultra-wealthy elites do with their 20s and 30s. He bought a mansion, threw a bunch of self-congratulatory parties, and slept with as many women as possible. Agnes Skinner even let him feel her up during the Great Depression. And at some point, he slept with the Countess von Zeppelin. In 1939, at his 25th year college reunion, he met Lily Bancroft, daughter of unrequited crush Mimsy. They expressed their love physically, which was the style at the time. Lily became pregnant and was forced to give up her child Larry and go to a convent. Basically, if you sleep with Mr. Burns, you end up devoting the rest of your life to religion. End of part two. This part of Burns' life is much more straightforward in comparison to his childhood, especially having Yale right here to anchor it, since his enrollment has always been so thoroughly documented in this series. Everyone knows that Burns went to Yale. After graduation, it's not all that surprising that Burns would let loose a little, especially with the Roaring Twenties going on. Still waiting for our version to start, by the way. It's interesting that we know next to nothing about Burns' business dealings during this era. I would think that there is something going on behind the scenes, maybe he's got some stooge successfully running things. But it's possible that Burns was simply splashing around with his vast, vast inheritance for a decade or so. He had such a large nest egg that the Great Depression could pass him by without him even being aware of it. However, World War II ended up being something that not even Mr. Burns could ignore.
Burns first enlisted in the U.S. Navy, rose to the rank of lieutenant, and served as Abe Simpson's radio man. Burns didn't take his role seriously, instead spending most of his time wooing the ladies, which caused Abe's brother to be shot down. The two of them were also shot down, and they crashed on a desert island. Abe Simpson, the low-class brute that he is, attempted to drown the king of New Burns Island. They managed to celebrate Christmas together, and Burns inadvertently shot down Santa's sleigh. He attempted to steal it, but after having a holly jolly dogfight, was forced to return it to Santa. <sighs> this part of their backstory is so dumb. Season 17, you and I are enemies now. Anyway, Burns later transferred to the US Army as part of the Flying Hellfish Squad. He was only Private Burns then, as he was demoted after obstructing a probe from J. Edgar Hoover. Private Burns continued being a terrible soldier for the Allied forces. On the other hand, he was an amazing double agent for the Axis powers. Not only did he foil an assassination attempt of Hitler, but he owned factories that successfully made shells for him. In addition, Burns recalls shooting at the Allied forces at times. He even found time to serve in the SS. Toward the end of the war, Burns saw the writing on the wall for Germany and turned his attention to personal financial gain. Remembering his inheritance and his dead siblings, Burns suggested forming a tontine to determine ownership of these stolen paintings. Gee, it sure is curious how Burns always seems to be the final survivor of these kind of things, huh? Funny that. One year later, President Harry S. Truman entrusted Mr. Burns to deliver a trillion dollar bill to Europe to aid in recovery after the war. You see, Mr. Burns was the wealthiest citizen and therefore the most trustworthy. Burns, the staunch fiscal conservative and miserly asshole, kept it for himself. End of part three. We've seen a lot of this World War II stuff before with the previous grandpa timeline, but I really like how Burns' characterization lines up with his previous era. That unlike Abe, Mr. Burns was coming off of a decade of parties and traveling abroad. He was the stereotypical lazy socialite who never had to work a day in his life. All that lines up perfectly. Nevertheless, both his Navy and Army adventures demonstrate that you should not underestimate this guy. As lazy as he seems, Burns will scheme and connive his way to the top. You can't give this guy an inch. I think World War II represents the big turning point for him, at least in terms of his mentality and motivation. The time for being a wealthy gadabout is over. We've got an empire to build. After the war, Burns finally settled down to focus on his career. This era was all about Burns building his business and pursuing his passions. In the 1950s, he became a big fan of professional wrestler, Clamorous Godfrey, not realizing it was actually his former army sergeant. We know Burns always took an interest in wrestling, but he was drawn to the unabashed villainy of Godfrey, the delight he took in making the crowd hate him. In the 1960s, he became chair of the Germ Warfare Laboratory at the State College. This career choice made a lot of sense, given his interest in both science and warfare, as well as his personal uselessness at armed combat. His work was extremely unpopular with students, hippies, and, you know, the non-evil community. So late one night, a group of hippies broke into the lab, released powerful antibiotics, and killed his precious germs. Mr. Burns was trampled during this escape and was injured badly. Mona Simpson, taking pity on him, stopped to help him. However, Burns turned on her, declaring that she made a terrible mistake and that he would make sure she will spend the rest of her life behind bars. Bye, Mona. Mr. Burns' rivalry with activists did not end there, though. He returned the favor by sneaking aboard Greenpeace and sabotaging them. End of Wavy Gravy. With his germ warfare dreams dashed, Burns turned to nuclear power as his next enterprise. He secured funding and proper permits to open a nuclear power plant in Springfield, working with respected scientist Wayland Smithers Sr. as his closest advisor. He held a PR event to win over the community, which was attended by young Homer J. Simpson, and unfortunately for Mr. Burns, his dog Bongo. Abe Simpson apologized for the dog, but much like Mona, was rebuffed by Mr. Burns. He will personally see to it that the dog is put to death. Later that evening, Burns tracked down Homer and Abe at their house, 
still demanding to hand over the dog. He made a deal with Abe to have him take care of the hounds for an entire year, and afterwards forced Abe to only wear slippers and a bolo tie for the rest of his life. Before I forget, one of these dogs that Grandpa took care of was named Crippler, who bagged his first hippie during this era, and proceeded to live for nearly 30 years. At some point, Mr. Burns dated and married a woman named Gertrude. We don't know exactly when this happened. All we know is that Burns missed their wedding, honeymoon, and divorce because he was working so much. This could have happened pre-war, but I would guess that it happened around this time in the 1960s, when he was working to get the plant up and running. We also know that he wrote a book called The Rungs of Ruthlessness, describing his climb to the top as CEO of a company. Well, maybe not the very top. When Burns set up the power plant, he set a canary as the technical legal owner. The early years of the Springfield nuclear power plant did not go particularly well. There ended up being a serious problem with the reactor. Wayland Smithers Sr. entrusted Mr. Burns to look after his son, and then sacrificed his life to save the entire town from a meltdown. Burns returned the favor by covering up his death, and telling Smithers Jr. that he died of a tribe of Amazonian warrior women. <sighs> Monty, you were this close to being likable. After this point, there is a large gap in the Mr. Burns timeline. We know that he met Elvis at some point, but we know next to nothing about this era until 1974, when the power plant opened up once again in Springfield. We've seen it opening when Homer was a young boy, we've seen it open when he's a senior in high school. Pretty weird. One explanation is that this is simply a retcon, and that detail from The Way We Was isn't a part of continuity. Or else, maybe something happened after the Whalen Smithers Sr. incident. Maybe he was the one keeping things together at the plant, and without him, Burns was forced to close the place. Maybe beloved Mayor Hans Molman shut him down. Who knows? All we do know is that he opened up the plant in 1974. And during that same year, he let a forlorn President Nixon beat him at golf. Six years later, he hired Homer Simpson to work at the plant. This should have been a mere footnote in Mr. Burns' history, but was somehow one of the biggest turning points in his life. Let's just say Burns' past history with meltdowns gave him crucial experience in covering up the later ones. And finally, from 1981 to 1985, Burns stole Crispus. End of part four. So, now that we've looked at all the miscellaneous bits of Mr. Burns' history, what conclusions can we make about this character, and how the writers handled his backstory? Obviously, a lot of the specific dates described in this video are not going to work in a linear sense, but that's to be expected given the floating timeline. Burns Baby Burns came out in 1996, so it picked 1914 for his graduation class. Monty Burns' Fleeing Circus premiered in 2016, so it decided that in 1913, Burns was only a child. It's fun to document these dates and laugh at how much Burns grew up between 1913 and 14, but I think the more important thing is to consider how true these stories feel to Burns' character, and why they diverge when viewed side by side. When I looked at Grandpa's history, I was surprised at how little the stories contradicted each other. They would tweak little details about Abe and Mona, but would generally drop into different parts of Grandpa's life. Burns' history is considerably messier, more in line with what I'd expect from the chaotic Simpsons timeline. Sometimes Burns left his parents and opened the plant when Homer was a teenager. Sometimes Burns stayed with his parents and instead opened the plant when Homer was a child. The writers refused to modify some aspects of his history, like going to Yale and being in World War II, but it's clear that Burns' history is more flexible and elastic than someone like Grandpa. Burns doesn't have characters like Homer and Mona to anchor him, so his history will always be more loosely defined. In terms of answering why Burns is the way he is, we see a definite split between the classic Simpsons and the later years. Early on, the show preferred the stance that Burns was just always kind of rotten, that it was inherently in his nature to be like this. Maybe he also has the evil gene. Whereas the later seasons were more interested in the nurture side of the argument, that there's trauma here, that he never became a compassionate and loving person because his parents never instilled it in him. Sai Shabab argues that his parents actually did love him, in the sense that they made him strong, made him the richest, most ruthless man in town. Okay, I guess that's one way to define strength. 
I'm actually kind of glad that Mr. Burns history is so messy, that his timeline doesn't provide a clean answer to what his rosebud actually was. Honestly, it's kind of apt that we don't know for sure. At some point, his story isn't about that. He had so many more chances than the average person to forge a new path. The C. Montgomery Burns timeline is one of those classic cautionary tales about how power magnifies things. Like when things go badly for someone like Grandpa, it only gets passed along to his son. But when someone like Mr. Burns goes bad, he makes everything around him bad too. Every story does need a villain though. Mr. Burns knew that better than everyone. So thank goodness we were given such an entertaining one. Let's all raise a glass and a toast to the greatest secondary character in Simpsons history. Mr. Burns, from the bottom of my heart, go to hell you old bastard.